Welcome to our talk, how to grow your internal backstage community with open source, or how I like to call it, with open sauce. Because let's be honest, everyone's internal backstage has their own internal flavor going on. But why not throw some sauce on top of that? But first, some introductions. My name is Jamal, software engineer at Spotify, and today I'm joined by... Mitch, another software engineer at Spotify. All right, let's talk first about why it is important to grow your internal backstage community. Imagine this, a year ago, you launched started your backstage instance, promoted throughout the company, and it's been popping off ever since. You get a ton of contributions. The hype is real, folks. But then, does it mean your backstage instance is in its best state? I don't think so. I want you to meet Ermo here. Ermo is a standard engineer who is not very confident about his type, TypeScript skills. He's also very intimidated by the Backstage framework. And for Ermo, we want to make things way easier. We want to convert Ermo into one of those happy contributors. And why do we want to do that? Because if we get more contributors, more plugins, Backstage will be even bigger within your company. So in turn, stimulating the growth of adoption. First, let's talk about continuously inefficient, or how other people talk, uh, say it, continuous integration. So, a week ago, I was working and I got this message. The build time is so slow, man. If you're a maintainer of a monorepo, you probably have seen this type of message before. So did I, so I started working on it. I first started my investigation. So I looked at the recently opened PR, I go to the checks and I look at the CI. So with GitHub, I can see how long every step is taking. Immediately, I see that the yarn install is taking the longest here, one minute and 27 seconds. But how can we actually fix this? I mean, I can go through the GitHub documentation, I can ask ChatGPT how to do it and probably get the wrong answer. Um, so I'm not really sure. And then it happens. My ultimate senior staff principal engineer comes by and shows me some backstage action. And I'm not talking about the wrong backstage action. I'm talking specifically about a GitHub action developed by the backstage community. So, so let's have a look on how that's actually set up. So here we have a PR of this great guy, Jamal. He used backstage yarn install. Let's have a look at the false change here. Here you can see that the line changes are already very minimum. But what is important here is that we are using the yarn install action from the backstage repository. And we're also passing in a cache prefix. Let's see if it's actually working. Show all checks. And here we can see that the yarn install now is only taking 13 seconds. Such a very minimum change for such a big win. Now let's talk about plugin ownership. Why is this needed? Again, if you're a maintainer of a mono repo, you probably have seen this message before. Again, Mitch, it seems that the sauce plugin is loading really slow. Can you fix that? And probably as a maintainer, you're not even the owner of this sauce plugin. So you have to find the owner and then redirect this message. It's very, uh, a lot of headache actually. So one way you can do it is go to code owners. And then you can see that the sauce plugin is owned by sauce frontend. But then you don't even know who's in that source uh, front-end team. You don't know what their Slack channel is. Again, a lot of headache. So what is another tool that we can use to define the plugin ownership? There's one tool that comes to mind, and that is the catalog. Because why not use the catalog? Let's think about why we actually have the catalog in Backstage. One of the biggest reasons is to display ownership of your microservices within your company. So why not do the same for our plugins? So here, I already have a PR set up called generate catalog info.yaml files for every plugin. And again, it's a very minimum change here. So there's only one command needed. Yarn backstage repo tools, generate catalog info. Let's go into files change. And here you can see for every plugin that we own, we have generated a catalog info.yaml. So for the source backend, you can see that the name is set to the actual plugin name. Sauce backend, and the owner here is owned by Sauce backend team. And also the Sauce common package here is owned by the Sauce infra team. 
And it's basically generating this based on the code owners we have in the repository. But not only that, let's imagine I have merged this and I'm now ingesting these catalogeva.yaml files into my backstage repository. All right. So here you can see we now have our plugins into our backstage instance. So let's also filter this uh, backstage backend plugin, click on it. And now I can just see the owner here set up source backend. I can actually see who's in that team and I know who to contact. But here becomes an extra bonus point that you have. Now that we have our plugins into our backstage instance, now we can actually do some health analysis on top of our plugin. So here we have a plugin called Plugin Health. And here you can see no issues found, a very happy Bowie, very lovey dovey. But let's go to another plugin. So for this front end plugin. Oh no, one issue found and a very angry Bowie. The plugin is depending on the wrong React version. Obviously, this is just a mock plugin, but think about the real world capabilities you have here with some real plugins like Soundcheck or Tech Insights. By using this, you can ensure that the quality of your plugins within your company is going to be of a high quality. Let's talk about updating Backstage. Who here is responsible for updating their own Backstage instance? All right, all right, a few folks. Who here sometimes is a few versions behind the latest Backstage version? Okay. <laughs> so again, I was working and I got another message and you never guess from who. Mitch again. Uh, this guy lost me. Oh, yeah. Um, hey, I love the GitHub integration, but my team also uses GitLab. Could you enable that? And because of this Mitch, of course I want to do that. So I go here and I see we already have an, or I'm opening the package with JSON of my backend package. And uh, I see a GitHub package here and I just want to duplicate that for GitLab just to see what it's actually offering. So I go here, all right, bring down GitLab. And then I just want to do yarn install. Okay, so we ran a yarn install and you can see it failed. No candidates found. That is probably because this version doesn't exist in NPM. Okay, so I go to NPM and try to find the correct version. Go to versions here. All right. I'm looking at this, I see 0.4.4, which is the latest, but my backstage version is a couple of versions behind. So I'm not sure if this version is compatible with mine. I see a next version. I'm not even sure what that actually means. So I'm skipping that. I see a bunch of nightly stuff. <laughs> It, it, that intimidates me. So I'm actually not sure what we can do here. Luckily, there's a Yarn plugin to the rescue, developed by our own Mike Lewis. Again, I have a PR here to show you how that's working. Again, contributed by this great guy, Jamal. It's on fire lately. So the plugin itself is enabled through this small line, Yarn plugin import, and then the location of the plugin itself. Let's go into the files change here. And here you can see for every backstage uh, dependency that we have, instead of a numbered version, we just put down backstage colon carrot. That is the only thing we need now. So to go back to our original problem here. Oh, messed up there. So now everything is set to backstage. So again, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to put down GitLab, save this. I'm going to run a Yarn install. And you can see it's already working. So now I don't even have to worry about what number to put down. And you might wonder, all right, how does it even know what version to use then? This is all because of the backstage JSON that we have in our root of our repository. It's looking at this version and immediately knows to which version it needs to resolve to. I'm really excited about this change. I think Mike did a fantastic job, and it makes package management and version management a lot easier. But I want to talk to you about something else. Let's talk to you about the dev entry point. And this is best demonstrated with a little demo. So let's get into it. So 
On the right hand side here I have my editor and I'm looking at a front end plugin, all right? And I want to show you some changes to that. And then uh, when I do that, it's going to show up in my browser in the bottom left. And we're going to do this edit together and um, it'll be great. But uh, thank you for your patience here. Sorry, it's just <laughs> taking a while to load. Oof. And uh, I'm going to blame Jamal for that. I'm sorry. Hey, thanks a lot. So <laughs> this guy has been pumping out code like crazy. We have a bazillion plugins and honestly the users are stoked. Our back to Genesis is great. But right now I'm a developer and I want to run Yarn Dev and this has got to build every one of these front end and back end plugins and, and then run them. And the other thing too which I'm realizing is actually some of these plugins have some like special requirements. Like I think one of them needs me to run some local service like memcache or yeah. Okay. So now it's not even running. Wow. This is a terrible demo. <laughs> or is this just some kind of elaborate ruse perchance? Yes. Let's talk about the dev entry point. Instead of running yarn dev, I'm going to go into the specific plugin, this front end plugin, the sauce plugin, and I'm going to run yarn start in there. And now, boom, already within seconds, my browser's <laughs> loaded. And look at this beautiful plugin. Look at these graphs. I love it. And just for kicks, I'm going to change some of these stats. And as you'd expect, even hot reloading, everything works. So, how does this work under the hood? What's going on, right? In my sauce plugin, here, I have a little dev folder and I've got this like index.ts file and it's got some stuff. Well, here's the thing. The details here don't matter because you actually already have this dev entry point. When you've generated a front end or back end plugin, you're getting, you are getting this for free. So you can be running this right now. So, hey, go for it. Get faster. Get your whole team faster. Use that dev entry point. Let's go. And once you've done that, you're going to reach the next stage and that is your backstage instance is now even better. You have even more. And now you're thinking, hey, the next thing I'm seeing is that there's some improvements I want to make to core open source backstage itself, right? So let's see how that looks. Let's do another little example. So here on my machine, I have two code bases. So this one here is my our instance. Uh, but if I kind of zoom out here, you can see I have the open source uh, backstage here as well. This is like the core main backstage framework. So I'm going to want to make some change here, but let's strategize for just a moment. If I go and I think about the change I want to make and I do it, the reason why I'm doing it is, I mean, like all of us, you're looking out for number one. You're looking out for your instance, right? So if you go through, you create your PR, you have it approved, you have it past CI, you get it merged, and then you have to wait for maybe up to a week and then there's going to be the next pre-release cycle, right? Finally then, you can take that brand new release with your funky change and then you can try it in your instance. But what if there's something special about your instance? Every instance is a little bit different, right? And what if that uncovers some strange bug with your change? Well, now you have to go back, make another PR, do the whole thing again. A weekly cycle? We can do better than this, right? If only there was a better way. Well, guess what? Again, I have great news for you. Look at this command I'm running here. I'm using this dash dash link parameter. So what's going on is this command is running in my main uh, repository, right? But I'm pointing it towards this other code base. So let's see this in action. Here, this uh, backstage instance that's running. Again, you can see it's my instance. It has my uh, funky plugin in here. And you can see we've got all of the components in here that Jamal ingested earlier, the, the plugins. Let's talk about an example change. Let's say I'm looking at the Teams page and I think, oh geez, I sure wish that the ownership uh, card showed the, the count. So just for the sake of the example, I'm going to go ahead and make that change here. And once again, hot reload. But the important thing to keep in mind here is that this, it's tying together both of these instances, my main one and the open source code base, and it works. Fantastic. So what's the two main benefits of this? Number one, you can make changes to upstream. You can be confident that they work on your machine. And two, this is just a flexible thing all around. If there's any unreleased backstage change, something experimental, you can give it a shot with your instance and see how it works. So that's fantastic. But there's one more thing I want to chat with you about today. And this was a little more abstract, so buckle up and hang out with me for a second. Let's zoom out. Backstage, like a lot of web apps these days, has two kind of main code contexts, I guess. You have the front end side and the back end side. And the good news is, is when you're working strictly within one of these contexts, life's good. Like, let's talk specific. I'm in the front end. I'm going to call another front end function. I can be really confident that this works. And that's because of a little thing called 
TypeScript. Thank you, TypeScript. TypeScript's going to make sure that if I am missing a parameter, or I'm providing a parameter with the wrong type, or maybe get a return value and I have a typo when I'm like accessing one of its fields, TypeScript will raise an error and it'll make sure I don't release that into production. But one concern, what about when we have between context work? What about when my front end calls my back end? Oh. Well, I'm losing some confidence now. Because, yeah, sure, I can type my front end and back end, but what if they're out of sync? Or what if I'm doing some, like, casting on the back end, and now it's returning something which isn't actually matching the types? Oof. This, this is a problem. Oh, I'm starting to panic. I'm doing a big panic now. No, 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 no. Don't worry. Technology's got our back once again. Let's chat about OpenAPI. Again, let's, uh, let's do a little example. So here in my repository, let's full screen this. I have this openapi.yaml file. Um, and it's, it's just a text file. It's defining essentially my, like, uh, my backend. But what this thing's job is going to be is to be that linking piece that allows integration between front end and back end to be something we can be confident in and we can feel strongly that we aren't going to have any spicy bugs. But OK, let's talk specifics. So this is defining a single endpoint. Let's pretend this is kind of like, let's imagine it like it's like a TypeScript interface or Java interface, right? So it's defining something with a single function, and we can imagine that the request body here, this is kind of like a parameter, right? And then here's its uh, potential return value, the response. So what I want is two things. I want to be sure that if my backend has any issues where it's not actually implementing this interface properly, I want that to be an error, and I don't want to merge it into production. And secondly, I want the ergonomics. One other thing I really love about TypeScript is when you're dealing with some object and you do IntelliSense, it can tell you, oh, this is that type. Here's what functions are available. Let's see if that works here. So let's start with the back end. Um, just for kicks, let's say, so I'm implementing this uh, open API spec. If I mistype my endpoint, within seconds, my IDE can tell me and I can avoid that bug. Not only is it catching it in, say, CI, I can see it within seconds right on my machine. Um, additionally, it can tell me the type of, say, this uh, tag field in the, like, as a parameter, the request body. Oh, it knows it's a string. It might not be set. Great. Let's go one level deeper. Let's talk tests. I've written some really, I'm going to call them OK tests. They're not doing that much. They're just checking. They're, you know, they're hitting the endpoint, and they're looking at the, the return code. That's it. Nothing funky. But look at this. We're using the OpenAPI backstage helper function here called the wrap server. Now, what this thing is going to do is any time that we talk to this endpoint during these tests, is it's going to validate that the runtime behavior, when, when the endpoint returns a result, it's going to make sure it's compliant with that interface we've defined. So let's see this in action. Let's say I'm going to change this. Instead of returning a widget as is, we're going to use this function, which, you know, there's some casting going on. Let's run these tests and see if there's any issues. Oof, look at that. There is an error. Oh, I didn't catch that. Did you see it? Well, the issue here is this is a Canadian and non-Canadian working on this. Someone's put a U in here, and here there's no U. Well, we better get that patched up. All right, is it green? Yes, it's going to be green. That's crazy. Nice. Sick. And one more thing to show off. Let's talk front-end ergonomics. Now we're back in that front-end plugin that we love from earlier. And I'm going to go ahead, and let's see what we have for autocomplete and so on. Here's that client. How's our IntelliSense? It can see this one endpoint. Perfect. OK, what options do I have for body um, like parameters, for um, body properties? It sees tag in there. Excellent. And of course, finally, in that response object, it can see what properties are there as well as their types. So let's just put this all together, and let's see if any bugs snuck through that I missed. So I have, uh, let's move this off to the side. Hey, snapping works differently on my Mac, I promise. OK, let's go back a couple uh, pages here. So in this front end plugin, I have it. That's the one we're looking at here. Where when you push this button, it's going to print out the created widget. So it's ID and, and the flavor. So let's see what we're expecting to, to spot there. Should be negative 1 and tasty. And sure enough, when I run this negative 1, flavor tasty, as you'd expect. Open API. So this is fantastic. And finally, we're going to have a little more confidence in our integration between front end and back end. And that means that your bugs are going to find a little harder to creep in. And that's what it's about. Jamal. Yes, thank you, Mitch. Amazing demos. So for our wrap up, to recap, we talked about plugin ownership, so everyone in your company knows who to contact uh, if they have an issue with a certain plugin, but also doing some health analysis on top of your plugins. Dev entry point, forget about starting up that fat backstage repository that you have. Just start up your single plugin. 
package linking contributions to open source have never been easier. Backstage action, a very minimum change for a very big win. The Yarn plugin, never have to worry about what version to put in, just use Backstage, golden, carrot. And then open API, like Mitch just said, no more box, client side, and in the back end. That is all what we want. Thank you all, folks. Any questions? Any questions? Raise that arm really high in the air. <laughs> There's a microphone behind you. But let, me, let me walk up to you, don't worry. <laughs> it's a little bit of an awkward uh, setup here. Hey, great talk. Thanks, guys. Uh, so since I'm here and not able to read the manual, this might already be in the manual, the thing our users complain about specifically with caching uh, are like node jip builds, things that you have to like do. Node jip has to do its thing for each OS. Does that repo tools thing cache those node jip builds as well? Or they just, just, they do? Exactly. Great. Exactly. Awesome. Thank you. All right. You're dialed in. Way to catch that. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? We got one up uh, front, uh, front left from your perspective. That's a stage right. <laughs> Just to confirm, the Yarn plugin only works with Yarn four, not Yarn three. Correct? Yeah, exactly. That's good. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good question. Any other questions? Hey, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for the talk. Hi. Um, so we are also iterating on our own standalone plugin development internally, and we've been using the the, the dev builder that you showed. Right. Um, but we've been trying to figure out how best to deal with things like authentication and how to uh, bootstrap the data that's needed and how to bootstrap the right back end for the, the plugin because they're non-trivial plugins. Now, what you just showed, so you would suggest to use this yarn link mechanism and have a, so, so that means a developer would have a, a backstage kind of instance set up and then they, they develop their uh, plugin in a separate re repo and then, I yeah, was a little confused how that whole thing works. Yeah, good question. So. Um, uh, I'm going to be a little bit confused because there are two different parts going on. Because um, just to make sure, I'm going to read back the question to you and you can confirm if I understand it or not. Uh, you're saying that, hey, the dev entry point is cool, but what if it has dependencies like it requires a backstage plugin to be running or you want to test it with auth at the same time? Is that what you're saying? Exactly, exactly. Okay. That's a really good question. Um, the tricky part there, um, I don't have a specific recommendation at the moment, um, but I can describe and say, like, when you're running the whole backstage instance, you have everything. The dev entry point is specifically scoped to the one plugin and it's ignoring anything that it needs. So making it so you're just running it and any of its dependencies and making that dynamically work for any potential plugin, there's potential there, but I don't have any recommendations for how you can do that today. That's a tough one. But you say you're building something, so I want you to contribute that upstream once you got it figured out. Okay, well done. Thanks. Thanks. You have a QR code there for feedback with a link. I clicked on it. There's no place to leave you feedback. <laughs> it's a uh, scared lied to me then. I will update the slide and have a new one. But thanks for checking. I should have done that too. My bad. I'm a developer, not a QR, QA person right now, right? So. 